Okay, so I've called this talk The Great Invitation. And while Christmas is definitely a big part of this great invitation, my goal today is to paint um, the event of Jesus on earth with a, a much larger story that is all about God's invitation to his people, regardless of when in history they happen to have been born. And we actually get much of this from one of the passages that Dwight just read from Isaiah, Isaiah 2, verse 2 to 5. So I want to put that up again, and um, I've, I'm using NIV today, just, just so you know. I think I did this last time, too. So. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This passage offers a lot of hope, as per our Advent theme. It's an invitation to something vastly better than the current situation. It offers hope and invitation to the people of Judah, for whom it was written. And like many biblical prophecies, it's meant to be applied to multiple time frames. It's for the people of the time, but in addition to that, there's a foretelling of Jesus and um, the welcoming of Jews and Gentiles alike into a fuller accessibility, a fuller, uh, a broader invitation to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of light. Um, also, there can be considered an big word, eschatological reference here, speaking about the end times and on into eternity, where, of course, the kingdom of God permeates everything and there's nothing else. But what I want to focus on today is that middle application, obviously. I'll, I'll start with a bit of history on the application to the people of the time, but then I'll move into an application for us, which you, you have to agree is the most relevant for us today. Um, so what does the kingdom of God look like in our time? How can we see it and live into it? That's what I really want to talk about today. Isaiah's message, both for the people of the time and for us, is nicely summed up in the very last sentence here. I love this, and I'm going to be repeating it multiple times today. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. It's beautiful. So I want to first paint a bit of a backdrop to help us understand that God has always wanted his people to walk with him in the light. It's not only a New Testament thing. Walking with God in the garden, in the cool of the day, has always been his plan for his people. Then, now, in the future, forever. That's what he wants. Isaiah prophesied from 639 to 681 BC to a nation that had turned a deaf ear to the Lord. Instead of serving him with humility and offering love to their neighbors, the nation of Judah offered meaningless sacrifices to God at his temple in Jerusalem and committed injustices throughout the nation. They turned their backs to God and alienated themselves from him, which created the need for Isaiah's um, pronouncements of judgment, declarations made in the hope that God's chosen people would return to him. And incidentally, one-fifth of Isaiah is taken up by pronouncements of judgment against other nations as well, which apparently were no better. But judgment did take place, so if we look at the uh, we have a timeline slide up here. So Isaiah was from Judah, which was the southern part of Israel, and the northern part was just called Israel. And before, just before Isaiah started prophesying, the northern tribes of Israel had fallen to Assyria. And you can see that on the timeline slide. And then uh, only a few years after Isaiah's death, the, uh, the, the southern part of the kingdom, Judah, fell to Babylon. But Judah did get a second chance in the form of a remnant, um, led by Ezra and Nehemiah. But if that's the only application of hope that Isaiah is talking about in this passage, it seems to fall a little short because even after the remnant, uh, three other empires would eventually dominate Israel. So the author must have been referring to something, um, something in addition to, to that. 
And when we hold this passage up to many other passages in Isaiah um, that talk about a future where the Lord will rule over the earth and peace will prevail, there's generally no dispute that a foretelling of the gospel is clear. And then also further ahead to Jesus' second coming and, and to heaven. So in essence, what's being foretold is that the wisdom of God will outshine all the wisdom of the world, all its philosophy, all its politics, and it will be equally accessible to all. And that's actually the age we're in, where God has established his kingdom on earth in a new and tangible way, and it's accessible to all. There is darkness in this world. We see it, but we are all invited to walk in the light. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So back to Isaiah's time, walking in the light would have meant devotion to God and his ways by following the guidelines that God had set in place for his people. These were good guidelines, and in fact, you can find both Old Testament and New Testament writers encouraging people to follow the same kinds of guidelines on both sides of, of the Bible, right? If we read a little further in Isaiah 2, um, in verse 6, which I'll put up here on the screen, he starts listing some of the despicable things that the people were doing and that they were going to be judged for. So I've, I've got this as an Old Testament passage, but then I want to put up right after that our New Testament passage um, that Jonathan read, uh, which lists some of the very same kinds of things. So this is, this is a universal principle that when people do not walk in the light of the Lord, there is judgment, there are consequences. They are full of superstitions from the East. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands to what their fingers have made. They're clearly not following God. They're not walking in the light of the Lord, right? And so if we put up the, the New Testament passage that we had today, we see kind of a similar thing. Um, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and drunk in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So when we read Old Testament and New Testament alike, there's a lot in there for us, the people of this time. And God's message has always been the same. Walk with me in my light. That's where I am. So, um, and this would bring us to, well, let me back up a bit. If, if people choose to gratify the desires of the flesh rather than walking in God's light, the result will be the same. So, but if that's the end of the story, you know, you don't walk in my light, sorry, but there's judgment coming your way, that would be a rather dismal end to God's story of interacting with humanity. Because humanity hasn't proven a whole lot of consistency, unfortunately, when it comes to walking in the light. So, I want to turn now to Isaiah's main theme, which I feel is invitation, back to my, my invitation slide, invitation through salvation. And so first I want to talk about what salvation is. Salvation is actually, um, if you try to explain it to somebody who's not a Christian, um, it can actually be, it can take a little bit of thought to, to help them understand it. And so I always find when my kids were young, um, so, and yes, they're not 30, they're, they're 20, but still, it was a long time ago when they were young. Um, I find that if you can distill a complicated subject down so that, um, you know, say a seven-year-old can understand it, you've landed on a way to explain it to pretty much anybody, right? So I used to, you know, when I, when I thought about salvation, I thought a child knows the concept of being saved from something, they can be saved from, you know, having to write a test at school because their teacher is sick. They get that. Ooh, saved. Saved that one. They can be saved from running out in the street when there's a car if somebody grabs them, right? So it's not the concept of being saved that's difficult to understand, but it's the question, well, what are we saved from? And so, you know, through thinking about it long and hard and looking into the scriptures, I came up with this definition for my kids. We're saved from life without God. And I think there's two stages to it. First, we're saved from life without God here and now. 
and then, of course, um, further on into eternity. Um, now, if we look back at the people of Judah, and when they would have been, you know, receiving Isaiah's um, words, if they would have taken his prophecy as only applying to the future and not to their current situation, um, that the invitation to walk in the light of the Lord was not at all for them, but only for generations to come, that's like us turning, focusing mostly on the future and saying that God's kingdom is for the future and it's not so much for now because we see so much, so much darkness now, just like the people of Judah would have seen kind of a hopeless situation. But I guess my, my goal today is to help us understand that God's invitation has always been open to people of Old Testament, New Testament alike. But I do think that we, post-Jesus, live in the most exciting of times in terms of what walking in the light really means. And that's because Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God in a more real and tangible way than people had experienced before. Over history, God had gradually been revealing more of himself to humanity and partnering with us in more intimate ways so that his kingdom can come, his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. And of course, Jesus on the cross and his resu resurrection was arguably the most pivotal piece of that story because no longer does walking in the light of the Lord look like following rules and guidelines. It means recognizing and connecting with the light that is now placed in us and bringing that into the world. So when I came last Christmas, I actually uh, spoke on that primarily, so I won't be diving into it uh, heavily today, but rather I'm going to try to carry it forward. So I guess this is like part two uh, one year later. <laughs> I don't expect you to remember exactly what I spoke about a year ago. Don't worry. So the question is, how do we live in this kingdom? How do we walk in that light while here on earth when we know it can tend to be a little evasive, right? The Apostle Paul talked about that when he said, we, now we see as though in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. There's a lot of things here we just don't know and don't understand and probably never will until we get to heaven. So what do we know? How, how can we make sure that we are um, walking in the light? So I want to um, turn now to the New Testament because fortunately, um, Jesus talked a lot about this kingdom of God, kingdom of light, and I'll use those terms interchangeably because he did. Uh, kingdom of heaven is another one. And so um, since Jesus spent a lot of time on it, I've got, I, I looked at Jesus' parables and I pulled out three things that I think are really applicable to us when we think of what this kingdom of light looks like. So, first of all, in the kingdom of God, sorry about my grammar there, <laughs> little things make a big difference. The kingdom of God uses little things to make a big difference. In Matthew 13, Jesus describes the kingdom this way. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, little tiny seed at the top of the slide there, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch on its branches. Um, I don't know this farmer in the picture. I described his picture online, but that plant looks like it's maybe about 10 feet tall. Pretty cool. In the kingdom of God, little things make a big difference. Have you seen that in this world? Maybe in your own life and in the world around you? A smile can make someone's day, right? Just a smile. A kind and thoughtful word can change someone's entire life. And an invitation to coffee, to dinner, can start a relationship that can last a lifetime. Not to mention an invitation to join Jesus in the kingdom of God. Have you ever felt small? And if the answer is yes, that's good. Because that means that you can move mountains in the kingdom of God. Don't ever underestimate the big difference you can make when walking in the light. The kingdom of God has a ripple effect. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. 
So I did a bit of research to find out exactly how much yeast and how many loaves that would make. So, um, and the math turns out to be pretty easy. Uh, so with 60 pounds of flour, we know that one teaspoon is needed for about a pound of flour, and a pound of flour makes about one loaf, so that makes it pretty easy. So that's about 60 teaspoons, which is a cup and a quarter of yeast. So what Jesus is saying is a little over a cup of yeast can raise 60 loaves like that. And that makes me, I don't know about you, but that makes me think of the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. Like, that was a miracle. I think Jesus kind of pre-made a miracle by creating yeast, right? Although I guess the creation of everything is a miracle. But uh, let's get back to the kingdom. The message here is don't ever underestimate the ripple effect of a small act in the kingdom of God. So not only do small things make a big difference, but they can reach farther than you know. An investment of time you make into an individual's life not only affects them, but their family, their friends, their entire posterity, their children, their children's children, and it can go on until the end of time. Um, when I was thinking about this, one human-made example that came to mind was the Pay It Forward movement, right? Where you'll just, unprompted, you'll, you'll do an act of kindness, and chances are the person who received that act of kindness will say, oh, that, that was nice, I'm going to do that too. Um, my kids used to work at Tim Hortons, and they would say that sometimes the, the pay it forward movement could last, you know, 10 cars or more, where somebody was paying for the car behind them, and they always like to see that. Um, but I also think of a funny story that my friend told me when he was once in line and he felt to pay it forward in Tim's, and so he paid for the people behind him, but in the kind of excitement of the moment, um, he forgot to take his own food, so he zoomed off without his <laughs> coffee and food. <laughs> So, but this is the magic of the kingdom, really, the kingdom of light. It tends to ripple out far and wide. Consider how the gospel itself spread around the entire world, and it all started with 12 apostles, right? 12 men. Jesus didn't need thousands. He just chose 12. The kingdom of God is mixed in with everything else to the point where it's sometimes imperceptible, but it's definitely there. Kind of like the words on this slide, <laughs> and like Waldo on this slide, and um, he's apparently somewhere there, but I did not take the time to find him, so I can't tell you where, but if you're, you're quick, you can maybe take a second look for him. And the parable is this one. Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But when everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling out the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, there's a lot we could unpack in this particular parable. Like, why did Jesus say it's better to let the weeds grow alongside? Um, but that's a whole other sermon, so we'll save it for a different day. For now, I just want to hone in on the fact that the good crop so the kingdom of God, light, etc., and the weeds, everything that represents what the kingdom is not, and darkness, are in this world together, side by side. And that's the way it is. And Jesus accepted that. You will find pockets of light in a world that seems mostly dark. But the good news is, and by now this should come as no surprise, a little bit of light goes a long way. Do you ever feel like you're the only light around for miles in your corner of the world? There are ships sailing in the dark, and your light is the only light they see. The light you shine, as small and insignificant as you may feel it is, is all they have to help them navigate towards the truth. I really had a lot of fun with the visuals. There's a lot of pictures in this one, I know. You guys are going to walk out of here feeling like you just watched a Sunday matinee or something. I should have brought popcorn. 
But uh, I figure, you know, Sunday morning, soccer game, it's Sunday afternoon, matinee, not a big deal. It, well, it would have been better if they won the game, I guess. But back to our sermon. Come, descendants of Jacob, walk in the light of the Lord. So what do we do with this invitation to walk in the light of the Lord, to walk in his kingdom here on earth? Um, I want to close with two, two words that came to mind when I thought about this, and they are lean in. Has anyone heard those two words before, lean in? They were coined in 2013 by Sheryl Sandberg, who was at the time the, CEO, the COO of Facebook. Um, she's a role model for women who feel that they, there's got to be a way to balance a career and raise a family and do both well. And so she wrote a book about that. Um, where she encouraged women to lean in to where decisions were being made, to where things were happening, to have a place at the table, even if they felt small or insignificant or that they weren't good enough. Now, incidentally, another book has recently been written called Lean Out, which uh, I'm curious to read because I feel like I'm starting, just finally starting to figure out how to lean in, and apparently now I have to figure out how to lean out too, so... <laughs> But um, I think that the phrase lean in has a lot of application for us here in terms of the, in the invitation to the kingdom of light. Because as dark as this world is, we do see the light. There, we do see light around us, right? Like I said, it's in a smile. It's in an invitation to lunch. It's in a Tim Hortons coffee. And I think after this sermon, Tim Hortons owes me a free coffee for all the uh, mentions I've given them. <laughs> this light is all around us, and it's in us. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So lean into the pockets that you see in yourself and in your corner of the world, and you will see darkness too in yourself and in your corner of the world. But lean into the light. And I just leave you with this uh, encouragement. Make, make it your treasure and it will grow. Give your time there, your money there, Find your peace and your joy there. And God's invitation to us is this. I'll see you there. Thank you.